In today's fast-paced, chaotic world of modern technology, scientific advances, and instant information, what does it matter that 500 years ago, a lone monk armed with his 95 church grievances and theological arguments would ignite what would be called the Reformation? The more we look and the deeper we dig, we find the impact of that day surrounding us more than we may realize. October 31st, 1517, an unknown monk named Martin Luther nails his 95 theses onto the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany. More than an argument against clerical abuses and corrupt church practices, the 95 theses became a catalyst for wide-ranging changes in not just the church, but also the political system and society itself. And these changes still affect us today. I'm your host, Sandy Miller, on our journey to uncover the impact of the Reformation today. The wages of sin is death. But while here on earth, the punishments for sins can be alleviated through penance. In the early church, penance was only used in rare circumstances. But by Luther's day, it was a common practice required of all Christians Penance are acts performed by the sinner to lessen punishment and gain forgiveness. The severity of the penance depends on the seriousness of the sin. From the mild reading devotions or the Bible, fasting, reciting chants or prayers, to the more extreme, wearing a psyllis or even self-flagellation. By the 10th century, penance can include making trips to holy places called pilgrimages, or viewing relics with special holy powers even buying indulgences, pieces of paper with the power of forgiveness. Late medieval Catholicism provided all kinds of ways of trying to make sense. I don't want to sound too sort of intellectualist here, but to deal with it, to cope with it, right? You could go on pilgrimage, you could pray for healing, there were relics, there were shrines. This was all about trying to deal with the misfortune that people experienced. And so if you take those away, well, what's in its place? By the 1500s, Pope Leo encourages the sale of indulgences as a way to raise money for the church, specifically building the extravagant Basilica of St. Peter. A monk named John Tetzel is given the territory of Germany to persuade the people there into buying indulgences to help fund this church in Rome. He convinces the people that when you buy indulgences, you are buying forgiveness. This infuriates Martin Luther. And he has to clear the function of the word of, of absolution. And first, he understood the absolution. I absol absolve, absolve you from your sin as a declarative act, a speech act in a declarative sense. And in a second step, in an effic eff efficacious sense, as verbum efficax, as a word, which does what it says. I deliver you from sin, and the sins are forgiven. Speaking this in the authority of, in the name of God. He had shifted the definition of what it means to be a Christian from basically a ritual-based religion, mm -hmm. uh, a religion that, that um, uh, tries to approach God on the basis of human, not just works in general, but sacred good works, especially in, in participation or attendance at the Mass. Luther, uh, he's not just attacking indulgences, he's attacking the way in which people are misunderstanding indulgences and the way in which this preaching undermines the gospel itself. One of the ways that the church taught people to understand suffering and to try to seek to cope with it was to view the actual suffering that they experienced, even sort of daily toil by which you get your daily bread, as a kind of penance. And if you endured it patiently and faithfully, didn't murmur and grumble like the children of Israel, 
Uh, this could reduce time in purgatory. This could help reform your character and help conform you more to the image of Christ, uh, rendering satisfaction for sin along with Christ's merit for sin. And you can find pastoral manuals, confession manuals, where lay people are specifically instructed to ask their confessors, I've endured this suffering. Please count it to, for me, to me as a, as a penance for my sin. Well, Luther posed that, that that doesn't work with justification by faith because all penance has been, has been paid for by Christ. Every plea has been paid for by Christ. And so, well, what's left then? Luther could still talk about suffering as a means of conforming one to Christ. Uh, he could still talk about it as a means of developing compassion for other people as they suffered so that one could understand their suffering. Uh, first and foremost, though, it was a test of faith. That's what the Reformation is always about. It's, it's about the reform of preaching. It's about uh, uh, getting the gospel out to all the people so that they understand what the mercy of God is and uh, um, that it's not something for sale. Every sermon has the function to set free, to, to free the, uh, the sinner and to say you are free, don't fear. Monks are men of prayer and deep religious convictions. They live in monasteries, withdrawn from the world and its pleasures, devoting their lives to prayer, fasting, and meditation. This is the epitome of being religious in the Middle Ages. More about how a person lives, what they say and do, and not so much about a person's beliefs. But living like a monk is hard to accomplish outside of the monastery. In the Middle Ages, there were sort of different levels of spiritual perfection. Kind of the, the kind of spiritual athletes, you know, were the ones who were, who were in the monasteries. And Luther, um, I think, wants to do away with that. This is part of the priesthood of all believers. Luther has made all monks to laymen because he make all laymen to monks. So not only the monks have to pray, but everyone from the morning prayer and thanksgivings at the table until the evening prayer. Everyone, every Baptist is a monk. His works, preeminently his catechisms, uh, became guidelines for the instruction of the people uh, and orienting preachers uh, in preaching the word. That's what the Reformation is always about. It's, it's about the reform of preaching. It's about uh, uh, getting the gospel out to all the people so that they understand what the mercy of God is. Some of those short little pamphlets that Luther wrote on how best to prepare for death, how to conduct oneself when the plague comes into a territory, how to teach children uh, the creed. These are uh, gems of uh, Christian interpretation of our life with the Lord, and, but are part of a much larger uh, improvement of the level of uh, Christian life uh, from Europe in the 16th century on down to today. For Martin Luther, it is not the vows of the monk, but God's promises in baptism that make one religious. For this reason, Luther will say that a person can be more religious by washing a child's diapers or fixing wagon wheels than by being monk-like. It is being religious in whatever context God has placed you, vocation or calling, terms previously restricted to describe the lives of priests, monks, and nuns. Luther now says applies to all people, and individual Christians have not only one calling, but several in the home, in society, in church, and at work. Luther hopes to see a saturation of the word of Christ into everyone's daily lives. There's a movement that takes place in 1518 with Luther's focus on the way in which the, the gospel itself, the promise, in the sacraments, in the word, in the spoken word, the preaching, uh, is actually the means by which God makes believers. Everyone is expected to live um, not a monastic life per se, um, but everybody is expected to be a spiritual athlete. The Reformation is a catalyst for the division of the church and causes people to rethink what it means to be a member of a church.
Is it to be a part of a visible institution? Or is it more about like-minded people gathering together for worship? The church splits and becomes fragmented. There are now a whole host of churches to choose from as your house of worship. When we look around the world in which we're living in the West, it's, it's pluralistic, which means there are um, multiple worldviews at work simultaneously. You can have someone who's motivated by a Christian worldview, someone motivated by a Buddhist worldview, someone motivated by a, I believe in nothing except science worldview. In the Reformation, uh, the time of Martin Luther in the 16th century, there was, there was really nothing like an ideology of pluralism. No one was, was advocating multiple religions or multiple confessions. Uh, they were all trying to struggle and to preserve the unity of the church. When Luther started his questioning of the theology of the Roman church, he was understood by some as simply being part of the way the medieval church worked, which was you had different theological movements held together within the same church. Others understood him as a heretic. If you were in Germany, you were Roman Catholic. And then as the Reformation happened and, and that monopoly of the Roman Church upon the religious life was splintered, the various reformers popped up. The idea that uh, people could successfully reject papal authority and survive both politically and religiously marked the 16th century movements off as something quite different. If religious unity was required for military unity, then religious differences were a threat uh, to the political and military stability of the society. The emperor's in this strange situation of wanting to prosecute Lutheran heresy and at the same time needing the military support of the Lutheran princes. There couldn't be one unified Protestant church uh, over against the, the Catholics. When this finally goes into open warfare, after Luther's death. The, the ultimate result of that is a victory for the evangelicals that forces the Peace of Augsburg in 1555. And this is where it was determined that the empire could tolerate two separate confessions of faith as long as they worked themselves out along political lines. In other words, territories and princes had to decide if they were going to be Lutheran or Catholic. Pluralism in 16th century Europe after the Peace of Augsburg was not the kind of pluralism we have where the, the Catholics and the Lutherans and the Methodists are all on the same street corners uh, or a block from each other in the same town. Each territory would be defined as a Roman Catholic territory or a Lutheran territory, and that, that identification was a result of the, the personal allegiance of the ruler of the territory. The Reformation introduced the possibility of choice. Are you going to follow the Reformers? Are you going to stay with the Roman Catholic Church at that time? And so I think one of the things that Luther did is, is he began to introduce the new age, the modern age, although he did not realize what he was doing. There were multiple confessions in Europe and uh, uh, those existed side by side and uh, uh, not always peacefully. One of the great things I believe about life in the United States under the Constitution of the United States is that this uh, multiplicity of religious denominations is encouraged. In the Federalist Papers, the, the Founding Fathers, James Madison especially, talked about there would be no state establishment of religion, that each, he called them sects, we would say denomination, you know, was on its own. No state funding, no state endorsement of a given religion. And that, I think, has proved to be very, very healthy because we're in the marketplace of ideas. We're in the marketplace of faith. Today's uh, pluralism is, in a sense, uh, untethered and wild. And I think some of it is a misreading, not just of Luther, but of, of, of the tradition. Um, when pluralism simply means 
everybody can do just whatever you want and you invent your own version, I think you're missing a great deal of the heart of the great philosophers of pluralism. Augustine lived in the middle of it and he does the canopy of the two cities, um, Luther's two kingdoms and so on. So you have to bring some sense of order to it. When I was confirmed, the pastor, this was a long time ago, was talking about the difference of denominations and he said, imagine that you have half a dozen glasses filled with water, but each one has some admixture of poison to it. Which water are you gonna drink? You're gonna take the glass with the least and ideally no poison in it. So yeah, we need to be discerning in our denominational age. It's, 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 it's an incentive to be in Bible study. Luther and the other reformers in the 16th century didn't uh, value variety and religious differences for their own sake. They didn't see pluralism as some kind of inherent good in itself. The society we live in today is a society in which we have daily common experience of wide-ranging religious differences, and that society is a result of the events of the Reformation. Today there are 24-hour news channels, the instant voice of social media, and viral videos making stars of your next-door neighbor. In the early 16th century, the public forum is the town square, or as in Martin Luther's case, the church door. His 95 theses might have gone unnoticed, except for the newest technology of his day, the printing press, which puts his opinions into the hands of the masses. They go viral, and Luther's voice is heard across the land. The Reformation took place at, as the culture is transitioning from an oral culture to a print culture. When people um, can read, you can read, you can stop, think about something, go back, reread. So it becomes sort of your personal uh, internalized message. As the seeds of the Reformation are taking root, Johannes Gutenberg's printing press is changing the world. What once was an oral culture, where you have to hear the spoken word, becomes a literary culture where the words are written. As more and more people learn to read, printers devise ways to get their words to the readers and the reader's money into their pockets. They have everything from broadsheets where they take a whole sheet and, and have some kind of illustration with also a paragraph. So people who could read could read the paragraph, but even illiterate people can look at the illustration and kind of get the point. The folio means we take the big sheet, standard piece of paper and fold it once, rather like a newspaper. You've got a sheet of newsprint folded once, a second time, and it becomes a quarto. Octavos are cheaper. Of course, every time you fold, it gets smaller and thicker. The Reformation latched onto this new means of communication, and they flooded the market with Reformation ideas. Everything from pamphlets to almost like uh, cartoon books, almost like what we think of as political cartoons, to sermon books, to catechisms, to uh, learned treatises. They all published their opponents probably by 20 to 1 for several decades. The church publishes mostly big and bulky books written for scholars, while the reformers produce short little snappy pieces aimed at the laity. And part of Martin Luther's genius is his ability to communicate with the masses. The 95 Theses, the letter to Albrecht, and then the sermon on uh, indulgences and grace that Luther publishes. And those three then will kind of be the essential documents of the kind of spark that leads to the Reformation. Well, Luther would we'd preach the sermon. He had a manuscript. The text uh, that is published is always longer. But then the sermons would be fleshed out because, because they also understand people are now reading these things. They're not just listening. When this sermon comes out, within the next three years, there are 20 reprints or 25 reprints, and that's what made Luther a household name. You know, as much as we talk that the ideas of the Reformation is, are what caught fire, which is true, almost as important is the way those ideas got out, and that is utilizing every available means of printing them or publishing them.
In the 16th century, the world becomes simultaneously larger and smaller. The new world has just been discovered, with whole new continents and civilizations revealed. But the view of our world is also changed by the discoveries of Copernicus. The earth is no longer the center of all things. There is much to learn, and education and schools race to keep up. The reformers play no small role here, establishing schools, providing public education for boys and girls, and developing new methods of learning in the universities. For the reformers, the goal is that all people will be taught of God, learning not only religion, but also new things about the vast and thrilling universe. The modern idea that civil government should provide public education for all of its citizens was already introduced by the reformers. In 410, the Goths sacked Rome. And that was the beginning of the end of the late Roman Empire. So by the end of the fifth century, many of the structures and institutions of, of the Western Roman Empire fell apart. And we come into this period which many have called the, the Dark Ages. Um, and there's, there is some truth to that notion that, especially in terms of the institutions and structures, that they had fallen by the wayside. For instance, education, uh, learning to read, was largely preserved um, within the religious communities and the monasteries, especially the monasteries of England and Ireland. But for the most of society, those basic educational institutions that we saw in the Roman Empire had gone by the wayside. Not until uh, the 9th century, 8th and 9th century, when Charlemagne became the, the Holy Roman Emperor and created some forms of stability in the West, were these institutions beginning to be resurrected. Charlemagne had a really important hand in trying to bring education um, into society. Uh, now he was looking for professional, literate people to help uh, uh, govern state. Um, and he turned to the literate people of society, the church, the monks, the bishops, those people who had retained education, and uh, urged them to establish more schools, more monastery schools, schools within cathedrals. By the time you get to Luther, you end up seeing civic lords more engaged in establishing universities and schools. So, for instance, Frederick, uh, the elector of Saxony, Luther's prince, established the University of Wittenberg um, right at the beginning of the 16th century. Schools are rare things. Luther wrote uh, a treatise on, uh, to the councilmen of Germany that they should establish schools because schools were a way of general education, which he thought was good, just simply for the populace. Luther believed that we are called to serve our neighbors. He believed that we should be educated and trained into uh, ways that we can serve our neighbors. And so he wanted children to go to school. He encouraged town councils to establish schools. He encouraged parents to send their children to school. He even encouraged them to send their daughters to school, which was revolutionary at the time. Early on, one of the goals, stated goals of the Reformation is that all people may be taught of God. And one way in which people would be taught of God is that they would have direct access to the scriptures. Children of farmers, children of uh, artisans, go to school, learn to read. Even the girls should go to read. Uh, if for nothing else, that they would be able to read the catechism and the scriptures in their own language. Among the normal populace, you wouldn't expect peasant farmers necessarily to do this. And they're the hardest ones to get to send their children to school because they need the kids on the farm. You know, I mean, we still have longer summer vacations because we still have this notion that kids have to go back and work on the farm. It's still a, kind of a, a holdover. The, and, and Luther, if he could get them to come even for several months, considered that sort of a success. He wrote a second treatise on keeping children in school in which he told the, the, uh, the people, you spend money on cattle and on barns and on fences, why don't you spend them on schools and on your children? Philip Melanchthon was the most important educator in Germany at the time. He eventually was called the preceptor of Germany. And one of the things that he did, in addition to writing textbooks that people would use in schools, was even design statutes and curriculum for other schools that other territories would imitate or model. Johannes Sturm was an adherent of the Reformation, who lived in Strasbourg. 
and uh, followed many of Luther's writings. And the way that he saw that he could um, further the Reformation in his own time was to establish a school. So Sturm's Academy in Strasbourg became one of the most significant and influential schools at that time. Uh, he dictated almost every hour of the day uh, on how it would be laid out, the kinds of things a teacher would say from, from class to class. Um, and so rigorous and well thought out was his school that others would come to watch it and to, um, to learn from the model that he gave. One important person was a young French reformer who came to Strasbourg and stayed several months uh, to observe the academy um, and talk to Sturm and learned about uh, how to further religious education and general education. Um, so impressed was he that he uh, used that model and tweaked it when he went back to Geneva. Uh, and this person was John Calvin, who established perhaps the most famous religious academy in Europe at the time. Yeah, the way that Sturm and then others conceived of education was all the way from a grammar school education all the way through gymnasium or, or what we would say sort of high school education. And in a sense that, that rigorous uh, division of the hours and the subject matter, those things are carried over into the way in which uh, uh, school, we still see that in school today. If you have educated people who are fulfilling their vocations and striving to do better in their vocations, striving to serve their neighbor better in their particular vocations, all of society benefits. The era of the Reformation is a tumultuous time with religious reform often used as a catalyst for revolution. Luther's freedom of the individual conscience becomes an excuse to defy all manner of authority and fight for causes political, economic, and social. Tyranny and tolerance, virtue and violence could all be justified by religious convictions, but the 16th century is also marked by attempts to argue for political resistance on its own terms. Conflicts are not unique to any age, but the battles fought then have shaped our modern world even in a country that once fought for its own freedom and independence. Following the Middle Ages, people seek the means for revolt against the tyranny of the times. Luther believed that princes, dukes, city councils, those in positions of authority, were there to serve the people. They were not there for their own benefit, for their own aggrandizement. They were there to enhance the lives of the people they ruled. And so you find Luther and his fellow reformers admonishing ruling authorities to do a good job, to take care of infrastructure, to take care of the poor, not to cheat people, not to waste people's tax money. Ruling authorities were to be in service to the people. The reformers speak out against the spiritual tyranny of the church, but some, like Martin Luther, struggle with the writings of the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, chapter 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. In the early 1520s, uh, Frederick the Wise actually asked uh, the Wittenberg professors whether he could uh, use his armed forces uh, as a prince of the empire against the emperor should the emperor crack down on Lutherans. Nicholas von Amsdorf, the nobleman, said, well, of course, he's an elected emperor and he was elected by the electors like Frederick the Wise. Uh, he's, he's subject to their discipline. Johannes Bugenhagen and Philip Melanchthon were more moderate. Melanchthon liked the argument that if there's notorious injury, uh, there's a kind of natural law right to defend yourself and whatnot. And Luther said, no, you simply have to suffer for the faith. This led to a kind of crisis for him uh, because governments uh, were, uh, were persecuting uh, the evangelical faith. And, and even the House of Habsburg, the, the, the imperial house, um, burned two of his fellow Augustinians and, and uh, launched the whole story of martyrdom in, in the Reformation period. In his writing on the freedom of a Christian, Luther writes parallel statements. The first statement, A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. 
This statement gains great popularity, while the second statement, A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. This receives less attention from the masses. The peasants' revolt, the, the, the enthusiasts of the 1520s very quickly disillusioned him, that in fact, um, left to themselves, people will, will not only take the truths of the gospel, but will, will uphold them without a whole lot of help from the magistrate <laughs> and from the clergy. So Luther was disillusioned at that point. In 1530-31, when after the Augsburg Confession uh, was, was given to the emperor and rejected by the emperor, Charles V, uh, and then there was the threat that April 15, 1531, you guys are back under Roman obedience or we're going to come with our troops. When the small Caldic War finally came, Charles V was not entirely successful in, in snuffing out Lutheranism, even in controlling territory. When, when he's there with troops, people will fall in line. When he leaves, well, the, the, the evangelical preachers, the Lutheran preachers may come back. But what is clear is that, uh, that he may be able to control the territory, but he can't control the hearts and the minds. And people have learned their catechisms, their little booklets at home. Luther started to rethink his position. So in his warning to his dear Germans, he um, actually is edging toward what became more explicit in the late 1530s, uh, a theory based on his understanding of Christian vocation. If the emperor is not fulfilling his vocation properly, then he has forfeited the right to uh, complete obedience. And not anybody on the street can resist, but the, the princes of the empire uh, can resist. In part, that was due uh, not to his theological convictions, but to a constitutional argument. It's a matter of calling, and, and the princes have the calling to keep the emperor in line. And that idea then uh, influenced uh, some of his followers who resisted Charles V after the Small Cold War in the city of Magdeburg. And in 1550, pastors there uh, drew up a confession, which was a confession of faith, but then also argued for the right to resist the suppression of the gospel, also with armed force, as, as Magdeburg was actually doing. It was a city under siege. Within the confession is a direct response to the Romans 13 passage. Yes, political authorities were appointed by God to do good. But if they are not doing good, then they could not have been appointed by God. Yes, we must render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. But if Caesar wants or takes what is God's, then we must withhold or retrieve it for God's sake. Yes, he who resists the authorities resists God. But if the authorities resist God, then surely we must avenge God's honor. The Magdeburg Confession became a well-known document. It was, it was written in German and uh, in Latin, and particularly in the city of Geneva, as the French government continued to persecute the followers of Calvin in, in France. Theodore Beza, for instance, uh, Calvin's right-hand man, picked up the ideas of the Magdeburg Confession. And then from Beza, it goes clearly into uh, the 17th century uh, work on, on resistance that led the Puritans to justify their revolt against Charles, uh, the, 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 the Stuart government and uh, resulted then in the Commonwealth. But even before that, um, people like uh, John Ponet or Ponet, I'm never sure how, how he actually pronounced it in the 16th century, uh, an English clergyman, an English theologian and bishop. Um, he's a good example of how uh, already in the 16th century, when Mary Tudor, uh, the so-called Bloody Mary, uh, began to persecute Protestants in the, in the 1550s, Ponet and, and others uh, picked up on uh, the Magdeburg Bekenntnis or Confession and uh, used it to formulate their own theories of resistance. This gave people the basis for what they consider righteous resistance against the government. The English um, had a, a revolutionary tradition that was really based on common law and and the lack of right of tyranny, we might say. No tyrant could be tolerated in, in human society. People in, among the early Puritan movement in England already 
we're picking up on the Magdeburg Confession, which reflects Luther's understanding that there's an argument to be made from the calling of the emperor to serve the common good, and when the government doesn't serve the common good, uh, resistance is possible. As the American colonists consider resistance against England, Poynant's teachings influenced the likes of John Adams, forming a basis for the American Revolution in 1776. Uh, John Adams was a very devout Christian, and he wanted to root his theories of resistance for the American Revolution in Christian sources. And Poynant's argument uh, was rooted in the theories of resistance all the way back to the Reformation. So John Adams recommended Ponet. Um, in fact, in his treatise on the thoughts of government, he repeated the basic tenets of resistance that we find in Ponet. What John Adams didn't realize was actually how deeply rooted this argument was in the Lutheran tradition and even in the ideas of Luther himself. Today, our idea of a just war is traced along this path back to the days of the Reformation. The Reformers are strongly against enforcing religion by the sword or coercing people into a particular faith. This sows the seed for a pluralistic society where many different faiths can coexist in the same land. The legacy of the Reformation opens up the path to the religious freedom of today, being able to believe or not believe anything we choose. The impact of the Reformation today jumps straight off the pages of our history books. James Madison, the father of the Constitution and the author of the Bill of Rights, credits reformer Martin Luther and his doctrine of the two kingdoms for his ideas on church and state. In an 1821 letter to F.L. Schaefer, Madison writes, It illustrates the excellence of a system to which the genius and courage of Luther led the way between what is due Caesar and what is due God. That without a legal incorporation of religious and civil polity, neither could be supported. James Madison and other founders of the country valued the Reformation from, first of all, from the standpoint of the priesthood of all believers. In other words, the people are empowered to make decisions for themselves, not only with respect to their spiritual life, but also to their, as far as their life in this world is concerned. So you have really the seedbed for the birth of democracy uh, in the Reformation. I suspect what Madison was talking about, and at least the way we've come to understand it uh, in our country, is that church and state refers to two institutions. Um, the institution of government and then the institution of uh, the church. Actually, we're talking about two institutions within the same realm. <laughs> uh, so in other words, when Luther talks about uh, the two realms, um, he's talking about the two ways in which God rules. Um, he rules in the left-hand realm, I would argue, you could call it the realm of creation. And in the left-hand realm, God is ruling for the purpose of um, uh, preserving life, um, enhancing life, uh, supporting life uh, within uh, creation. Uh, the right-hand realm is where God works uh, his work of redemption in Christ, uh, gathering a new church uh, for the sake of the uh, new creation. Now, within those two realms, I think it's probably somewhat of a stroke of genius on Madison's part to uh, speak of the uh, distinction of two institutions within the left-hand realm. The U.S. American principle of the separation of church and state, um, Luther would have found very unrealistic uh, because he believed that um, every uh, society uh, needs some kind of ideological base and he didn't think it was absolutely necessary for a functioning society uh, to be Christian. He said uh, Turkish society can also function well and he thought ancient Rome, ancient Greece uh, had a, a functioning society without the Christian uh, basis that his society had. Um, but he always saw uh, leaders as working from some religious convictions about, about what is good for society, what it means to be human, uh, what puts the world in its framework. 
Now, with respect to the government itself, I think James Madison finds uh, uh, or plays a, a very important role because he's really the author, the principal author of the, of the Constitution. And what's unique about him is that, uh, unlike Thomas Jefferson, who went to William and Mary in Virginia for college, James Madison goes to the College of New Jersey, which today is Princeton, which is a Presbyterian school. And he's exposed to Calvinism, which is part of the Reformation. And two things really stand out in terms of his thinking about the government. And number one is that in, in a Calvinist fashion, he recognizes the sovereignty of God. That God is the one ultimately to whom we owe allegiance. And so that feeds into his thinking about there needs to be religious freedom in America so that people are free uh, to exercise the duty that they have that transcends the duty that they may have to any form of society, uh, any form of government, allegiance, allegiance to any institution and to exercise the allegiance that they have ultimately to God. And then secondly, in Calvinist fashion, he uh, recognizes the, uh, the factor of human depravity, human sinfulness. Huh? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's really based upon Madison's understanding of uh, Reformation theology. Perhaps no other aspect of Luther's social and ethical teaching produces as much discussion or controversy as his phrase, two kingdoms. And whether James Madison rightly interpreted it or not, the fact remains that roots of the term separation of church and state can be traced back to the days of the Reformation. The 16th century is a time of great social and economic upheaval. Centers of money are shifting, and a rising form of capitalism begins to challenge the church's thoughts on money. Before, money could be used to secure salvation through buying indulgences or giving alms to the poor. But now the Reformation gives money a new focus and purpose. Salvation is not purchased, but is from beginning to end God's gift. Money is for our daily calling in the world and for service to society and neighbor. The faithful Christian life now means working hard, being successful, and earning money all to the glory of God. Today, the work hard and be successful ethic may often be distorted, but its roots lay in the Reformation. Time is money. He that can earn 10 shillings a day by his labor and goes abroad or sits idle a half of that day, though he spends but six pence during his diversion or idleness, he has really thrown away five shillings besides. Remember that money can beget money and its offspring can beget more. If time is money, if a normal working day would be such amount, but you only spend half of it working and the rest in idleness, you have to count the money that you would have made. The money is lost. There's a sense that money generates additional money. He that kills a breeding sow destroys all of her offspring to the thousandth generation. He that murders a crown destroys all that it might have produced, even scores of pounds. Well, that's just not a Reformation concept. This is a very American concept, a very foundational principle in thinking about money. A seminal work on capitalism comes in 1934, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism by Max Weber. Protestantism has given birth to a kind of work ethic that is the engine behind the spirit in a capitalist economy. So his argument is quite specifically that there are shifts in the Reformation on the way of thinking about vocation, about money, that enabled the possibility of capitalism to go in the direction that it did. The old feudal society is quite different. The feudal society is a, has a very different arrangement in terms of labor and work and property. There's this, this oath of fealty, this oath of loyalty that, 
that is taken between a feudal lord who owns the land, protects the land, uh, or perhaps uh, has a claim actually on the family members, the, the newborn children uh, on his land. And he's supposed to be there to protect them, to protect his land, uh, to guard them, uh, and, and to be their assurance that the world will remain in order. In exchange for the work and the ability to work the land safely, they receive some of the bounty of that land. They also give a significant portion of, of the bounty of the land and often of their time to the feudal lord. That's a very different view than if you work hard, then the produce is yours. These are my taters. I planted them. I dug them. They're mine. And who's going to tell me that I owe them to him? Other things have come into play to move European society out of feudalism to a place that people can say, this property is mine, this work is mine. Luther was living in this transitional period, this shifting stretches from 12th or 13th century into the 16th and 17th century, a long period of transition where, where goods evermore ceased to be a means of exchange and money replaced uh, goods. A key characteristic of Weber's argument is this notion that the Protestant Reformation, specifically Luther and then the heirs of Luther thereafter, had a new view of secular vocation. That it was a Christian calling to be a cobbler, to be a farmer, as well as to be a mother or a father. This Christian calling of the secular life, of a life of work and labor, Weber points out is, is the key shift in Reformation thinking. He notes that when you really see momentum behind capitalism coming, it happens not so much within Lutheranism, but especially as it plays out in Calvinism, in countries dominated by Calvinism. The theology of vocation or Christian calling gets tied first for religious reasons and then just for reasons, uh, practical reasons, you know, with hard work and with one who works well, and makes money, and has property. That's how you glorify God, living not only as a good cobbler, but the very best cobbler. And you can be frugal, and you can use that money wisely, etc. The reformers say being the best you can be leads to living your Christian vocation to its fullest. But for good or bad, this inadvertently opens up the road to our capitalistic society. With the invention of the printing press, the written word becomes accessible to all people. Among the first books printed, the Bible. It's now available for all to see. Martin Luther would insist that any of the changes in Western civilization during his lifetime had been achieved through this availability of the Word of God, rather than by what he and his fellow reformers were doing. But making the Bible available to all in their own language is perhaps Luther's most enduring legacy. Before the printing press, books are rare and take extended periods of time to create. They are handwritten, big and bulky. But the printing press allows books to be created easier, faster and cheaper, making them more readily available to all. Johannes Gutenberg invents his printing press around 1450 in Mainz, Germany, and one of his first printings is the Bible. As literacy increases, uh, people can read the Bible for themselves. People are able to distinguish from all the stories they've been told by the church, which ones are from the Bible, and those that are popular legends about the saints. People will sort of on their own get all sorts of crazy notions, but if you put two or three people together and they discuss things, it's a sort of a, a break. You know, so well, that's not what the, the, the words are saying, that's not what the text says. When Luther proposed a German translation of the Bible, it was part of an overall program that was based on the idea that all Christians could understand the Bible and didn't need expert interpreters between them and the text. When people um, can read, you can read, you can stop, think about something, go back, reread. So it becomes sort of your personal uh, internalized message and, and can, can mean a lot more than if you just have the oral presentation. Yeah, it's a big deal. Having the Bible in one's own language would lead to a cultural revolution. Martin Luther's Reformation is first and foremost a reform of pastoral care. 
people are longing for a deeper devotional life and a greater pastoral presence in their lives, comforting them through illness, grief, and daily life. Even one-to-one -one praise and prayer. These changes impact people's individual faith and what it means to live a Christian life. In the Middle Ages, the celibate life is considered more holy than married life. This belief leads 25% of the people to celibacy. In the late 15th century and early 16th century, approximately one in four people had taken a vow of celibacy. 25% of the population are seeing marriage, both socially and religiously, as something to be avoided. The Middle Ages had, had placed marriage, it wasn't evil, but it was on a lower scale than celibacy. Uh, celibacy was a holier way of life. And, and Luther said, no, uh, we've practiced celibacy just to earn our way into heaven. So it was, it was a matter of his basic understanding of our way of salvation. But it was also part of his doctrine of creation that, that he has created us in, in the family uh, and created the family to nurture a human life and, and bring us up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. By the time you get to the late Middle Ages, there clearly is an established hierarchy of what it means to be religious. In the late Middle Ages, to be religious is to follow this monastic pattern, to follow these vows of celibacy, obedience, and poverty. In particular, the interpretation of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and his dialogue with the rich man was used to justify these two different tiers of Christianity, these two types of religious life. When Jesus met the rich man, the rich man asked, what must I do to enter eternal life? And Jesus says, you know the Ten Commandments, follow those. And his response was that I have done all these since my youth. So then Jesus responded, if you would be perfect, sell all you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. The church took this dialogue between Jesus and the rich man and interpreted it as talking about two different types of religious life. On the one hand, you had people who, living their life in the world, tried to be obedient to the Ten Commandments and through that kind of life would eventually end, enter into the kingdom of God. And then there were those people who would be perfect and they had an advanced spiritual status. They followed Jesus' more strict counsels and commandments. Luther ends up turning this whole notion of a two-tiered Christianity upside down. Instead of the monks or the priests being the spiritual class and lay people being a secular class, Luther recognized that baptism in the scriptures described all people as priests. This is what truly made you religious. This is what truly made you spiritual. And the role of a bishop or a cleric or a monk was really an issue of human invention, an issue of order, and not an issue of spiritual status. Once Luther had realized that the spiritual class, the priests, the monks, the bishops, were no better in God's eyes than the non-spiritual class, well, then the way was open to view all sorts of vocations as ways to serve God and neighbor and to please God and neighbor. One of those vocations was the vocation of the family, marriage and family. The calling of family life, uh, in a sense, replaced the, the um, monastic and priestly callings for Luther at the very core of God's plan for society. In the large catechism, he says, Essentially, if nothing uh, works in the family, nothing else in society will work either. Father and mother in the family were seen as both having callings from God. These were vocations. They were just as holy as any calling to be a priest or a monk or a pope or a bishop. As baptized children of God, they all can stand before God on account of Christ. They have roles as parents, father and mother to, in the home, and they become in effect kind of the, the pastor, the priest and the priestess, as it were, uh, in the home uh, for family purposes. More religious than the monastic life is the married life. Married life is the epitome of religious life. 
As the institution of marriage develops in the Middle Ages, it becomes one of the seven sacraments of the church. Martin Luther views marriage from a different perspective. For Luther, marriage is not actually a churchly act. It's rooted in creation, in the broader life of humanity. In a sense, it's there before there's even a church. It's instituted in Genesis 1, and therefore marriage is something that's rooted in creation, not in redemption. Marriage is outside of the church. Pagan marriages, according to Luther, are still valid because they carry out God's intention in the first article of the creed, that human beings would be fruitful and multiply. And this was seen as the bedrock of all social structures. Be fruitful and multiply is more than a command. It is a divine ordinance of work which is not our prerogative to hinder or ignore. It is not a matter of free choice or decision, but a natural and necessary thing. By putting marriage into the civic and social sphere then, it's regulated not by churchly canon law, but rather by the state, by social and civic norms. So much would this be the case that Luther would see marriage as something that happens outside the church, in the civic sphere. And then, perhaps you would go into the church and receive a blessing and celebrate that marriage. Thus, Luther interprets marriage as an institution rooted in natural law and in nature. In his commentaries on Genesis, he reflected how in the Garden of Eden, after the praise of God, marriage and procreation would have been the greatest work of human beings. Martin Luther is centuries ahead of his time in his writings on the role of fathers. I confess to thee that I am not worthy to rock this little babe or wash its diapers, or to be entrusted with the care of the child and its mother. How is it that I without any merit have come to the distinction of being certain that I am serving thy creature and thy more precious will? Oh, how gladly I will do so. In many ways, the, the, the way that a Christian is going to be most closely conformed to the image of Christ is through washing diapers and caring for kids and just sort of dealing with all kinds of things that are uncontrollable in family life. I think one of the biggest differences between the monastic life that he experienced and family life is that um, in monastic life, one is still in a sense in control of what's happening because there's a daily regimen and you know what's coming. Now, I mean, it's a human community, so there's unexpected things happening. But nonetheless, it's the regimen, the routine is essential to the spirituality. Well, when you've got, you know, young kids crawling around the floor and who knows what hour they're waking you up at night, you're not in control of this. You're not in control of that experience. So I think in that way, uh, Luther's taking, borrowing of this language from the monastery and applying it to the family life um, that shows an important transition in the spirituality. He recognizes that, that there is a new sphere here. I mean, there were other people who were writing about this before Luther as well, but Luther especially emphasizes family as a primary sphere of, of spiritual development. And I think that's something that's still extremely important for today. We hope you have enjoyed this journey to the days of the Reformation and have a better picture of the radical changes that began and appreciate the reverberations that started there that impact our world today. For Concordia Seminary St. Louis, I'm Sandy Miller. Thank you for joining us on this journey.